Let us pray. Loving God, your mercies are fresh with the morning, and your grace amazes us into joy. Grant that in our worship today and in our daily living, we may be deeply aware of the strength of your mercy. Move us to share that strength in the world. Amen. If you turn to your worship sheet, we will be moving on to the epiphany of peace.
reading from Matthew 38 through 41. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Good morning. I'm really glad to be here because I have the rare privilege of working for the 2200 or so members of the Lutheran Peace Fellowship. And so I bring you greetings from them. And I'm glad to be here to talk with you about a very troublesome text. I think it's one that all of us have heard. And I find it, in the past at least, sort of troublesome to deal with. I think all of us can agree that an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth results in nothing more than a bunch of blind, toothless people. But the next part is harder. Do not resist one who is evil. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other, go the second mile, give your coat as well as your cloak. Jesus clearly is telling us not to take revenge and not to do violence. But this text would almost seem to indicate that the alternative is that we are to be passive, passive victims of evil. And you hear it all the time, this either or sort of approach. You're either an oppressor or a victim. You're either violent or you do nothing. You either, uh, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer by training, and so in the legal system, we have these same kinds of things. You're either innocent or guilty. You either win or lose. You either pay damages or you get them paid. We also are seeing it, I think, these days in the rhetoric about the war. We had to go to war or else we had to leave Hussein's aggression go unchecked. We don't want Iraqi civilians to be killed, but we have no choice because we have to bomb the military. We have to approve of the war or else we're not supporting the troops. So how do you deal with this sort of text? I found in my own life as a practicing lawyer for seven years, uh, especially in the areas of family and juvenile law, that this adversarial model was not really a very good one especially where there were continuing relations and in, in situations of divorce, if there's children, there are continuing relationships. And going to trial, which is really in some way a, a war of words, really was very difficult. You assigned blame, you looked at the past, you took an either or position and then tried to duke it out in the courts. And it was a very un expensive and unsatisfactory way of, of dealing with this, again, either or mentality. The alternative I found in legal practice was mediation, where a neutral third party listens and hears both sides and then helps them work out a third way. If there's an issue of custody, it's a matter of not which party will have custody, one or the other, but how will both parents continue to parent those children. I've seen mediation work in situations where other couples would go to trial and spend a lot of money. And I've seen the satisfaction of people being empowered to work out their own nonviolent solutions. About this same time, I read an article by Walter Wink. Uh, it's in the December 86 issue of Sojourners. And for me, it was like a breath of fresh air because it took this text and interpreted in the way that I think is faithful to what Jesus was talking about. Walter Wink talks about how this, the court translators of King James, in choosing to translate a word, which I hope I'm pronouncing correctly, ant antistini, which is resist not evil, that they really mistranslated it. That a correct translation would be, do not strike back at evil in kind. Do not give blow for blow. Do not retaliate against violence with violence. And I think this puts a whole different spin on things. We usually are told that there are two ways. You either fight or you're passive. 
But what Jesus was talking about was a third way. He was telling us not to resist evil with evil, but he also was not telling us to do nothing. And then he goes on and he gives three examples of how we are able to come up with creative nonviolence. The one about turning the other cheek. In the context of Jesus' time, if you make a fist and hit somebody, you're going to hit them in the left cheek. And the, the text talks about the right cheek. What was being talked about was a backhanded slap, the kind of thing where you try to insult somebody, the kind of thing which, in, which a superior does to an inferior. In, in our own country, that was how you started a duel, with a backhanded slap. And what Jesus is telling us to do is, and he was talking, remember, to people who were the victims, people who were slaves or people who were, were, were at the bottom of society. What he's telling them is to turn the other cheek in order to rob the oppressor of the power to humiliate. Not to be a victim, but to, in effect, say, try again. Your first blow failed to achieve its purpose. I deny you the power to humiliate me. In the, in the movie um, Gandhi, there is this scene, if, if you've seen it, where the Indian people are, are, well, the British soldiers have sort of set up this line and say that anyone who tries to cross it will, will be beaten. And wave after wave of Indian people come up and are beaten. And it goes on for hours until finally it is the British who are defeated because the people will not allow the power to be humiliated. Martin Luther King, I think, did that same kind of thing. Um, it, when, when, the, when Bull Connor turned the hoses and the dogs on children and they remained singing as they were loaded up into police vans. So what Jesus is telling us is not to give the power to be humiliated. The second example is one from, from a court uh, where, where the, uh, if somebody sues you for the, the cloak, you give them the coat too. And this comes, Walter Wink says, from, um, and, and he quotes a, a text from Exodus. If you lend money to any of my people with you who is poor, you shall not be to them as a creditor and you shall not exact interest from them. If you take your neighbor's garment and pledge, you shall restore to them before the sun goes down. For that is their own, only covering. It is the mantle for the body, and what else shall they sleep? And if they cry to me, I will hear them, for I am compassionate. So in this example, what was happening in Palestine was the poorest of the poor had really nothing left but their clothes. And what was happening was absentee landlords or the wealthy trying to take even this cloak as a way of collecting. We see it now in small claims. It has become a vehicle for creditors to try to get poor people to pay their bills. And in Palestine, what was happening was that for poor people who, because of exorbitant interest rates, had finally been forced to sell their land and had nothing left except their clothes, now you had creditors trying to take that as well. And what Jesus is telling here is, OK, give them your, your uh, coat, too, or your, basically your underwear. And I'm going to read from Wink because he says it better than I could. He says, put yourself in the debtor's place and imagine the chuckles the saying must have evoked. There stands the creditor, beat red with embarrassment, your outer garment in one hand, your under underwear in the other. You have suddenly turned the tables. You had no hope of winning at trial. The law was entirely in the creditor's favor. But you have refused to be humiliated, and at the same time you have registered a stunning protest against a system that spawns such debt. You have said, in effect, you want my robe? Here, take everything. Now all, all I have left is my body. Do you want to take that next? Nakedness was a taboo in Israel, but the shame was not with a naked person, but with the person who caused it. And so what 
this, this tactic in effect did was unmask an oppressive system. What Wink goes on to talk about, uh, the creditor is revealed not to be a respectable money lender, but a party in the reduction of an entire social class to landlessness and destitution. The powers that be, he goes on to say that one of the things this does is help the creditors sort of really realize what it is they're doing. And says the powers that be literally stand on their dignity. Nothing delegitimizes them faster than deft lampooning. By refusing to be awed by their power, the powerless are emboldened to seize the initiative even when structural change is not possible. This message provides a hint of how to take on an, the entire system in a way that unmasks its essential cruelty and to burlesque its pretensions to justice, law, and order in situations where it's unfair. Jesus' third example about going the second mile. Under Roman law, soldiers could impress into service any civilian to carry their 65 to 85 pound pack for one mile, and there were mile markers along the way. If a person voluntarily uh, agreed to go a second mile, what that did was suddenly change the whole power balance because potentially the soldier could be in trouble because he had violated the rules and there, were, there was military punishment if you forced somebody to go the second mile. And again, what you've done is you have sort of turned on end the power relationships and you have said, I am not going to, I'm not going to hate you, but I'm also not going to um, support the oppression of my country. And so all three of the examples that Jesus gives are examples of creative nonviolence, of ways that we can step beyond the either or against succumbing to violence, which does nothing more but beget violence, and not succumbing to being passive and saying, oh, gee, there's nothing I can do. Isn't it awful? I think that there are creative examples like this. And I think that what we are called to do is, in silence, in reflection, in community, to think about those kinds of ways. And I think never has, has there been a greater need than in this time of war. There, there are a couple of examples that come from Central America where they have long experience with war, that I think maybe have something to tell us as examples for our own time in terms of how we might be creatively nonviolent in, in war. One of them is the mothers of the disappeared in Argentina. What, what they started doing as their, their family members were killed or disappeared is they took the picture of their loved one and in silence marched in the square. They didn't shout or yell. They weren't violent. They gave a witness to their loss. And eventually in Argentina, that turned things around because as more and more women came and showed the pictures of their people, their loved ones who were gone, there was a change. There's another one that comes out of Central America, I think it's Guatemala, where a whole generation of men has been killed, and protest usually results in death. And so there's this dance that women do. It's called Dancing with the Dead. They dance alone because they realize and because they're making a statement about all of the people who've been killed and about the uselessness of war. I've been thinking a lot about, about how can we do creative nonviolence. How can we, in this time, move to something that will, will symbolize uh, a third way, a way that both supports our troops and our country, but clearly and firmly says, no, war is not the answer. I, I think this is something I invite all of you to struggle with. Um, there aren't, I don't think there are easy ways. Some of the examples that, that have come across my desk and that I just want to toss out as possibilities. One of them is that, that maybe what we need to do instead of demonstrations is silent vigils with candles where people are spilling out of the churches with their candles as a way of, of protesting the war and also a way of symbolizing being for something that is light and good. 
maybe along with the No Blood for Oil, which has been one of the, the uh, themes that has repeatedly been used, is that maybe the place to take our signs with No Blood for Oil is to the Red Cross as we're giving blood for the troops. Maybe uh, it is going to the funerals of the people who have been and will continue to be killed, and then maybe taking in a very respectful and silent way the body bags or symbolic body bags to our members of Congress and our senators. Maybe it's declaring an emergency Sabbath, a special day that we set aside for prayer and for working for peace. I don't know what it's going to be for, for each of us. I think that's different. But I think clearly what we have in, in the text and in the story that Jesus um, gave or the examples that he gave, we have ways of getting to creative nonviolence. And I think that's what we are called to do as Christians. I'd like to close with a prayer. O oh God, who has called us to be your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths of creative nonviolence yet untrodden, through perils and joys yet unknown, please give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing exactly where we go, but only that your hand is leading and your love supporting us. Amen. Our thanks to Bonnie Block from Lutheran Peace Fellowship. She is located in Madison, Wisconsin. If you want more information, we have it. We happen to be a part of that. If you didn't know, also to Tom Witt, who was former director of Lutheran Peace Fellowship, now at the Center for Global Education, and Jane Austen, for being here and also Scott Coleman for reading. Uh, as our departing departure song, we're going to sing Let Justice Roll Like a River, and Tom will instruct you as to how to do that. Just join us on the chorus. <laughs> is a Your laughter 
context of uh, calls for uh, national prayer, uh, in context of what we've been doing recently here, some words from Philippians uh, came to mind. Have no anxiety over anything but in prayer and supplication, let your request, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes understanding, will keep your hearts in Christ Jesus. I don't intend to preach on this text this morning, but wish to respond to it in another way. I would like to uh, introduce some of you, at least, to a form uh, of prayer which may be new. And I would like all of us to experience once again, however briefly, the value of silence. If one looks at uh, the practice of worship rather than its theology, I think it's quite undeniable that most Christians feel that unless there is a production of sound, unless something audible is taking place in the service, then nothing is happening. So we must always be uh, reading or responding or preaching, singing, intoning, or listening. And if by accident there is a moment of silence, we feel at least in some congregations absolutely compelled to fill it to the brim with an organ interlude. At the risk of those of fit who uh, are committed to this way of thinking, and uh, risk of offending those, this morning we will use the sermon or meditation time for prayer. Except for the Quakers, uh, most people are uncomfortable with silence and service. Although in the ancient church they had a very interesting uh, practice that one part of the service, the person who was presiding would say, let us pray for, and would say something, and the people then would pray uh, silently, and then the pastor or presider would collect all these things. It came to be called a collectio, that all of these petitions that he could think of, he or she, and, uh, and that was the collect. Now, if you look at our worship service today, we have a collect, but we have no time for what was came to be called the bidding of the beads, that is, the invitation of people to present their particular petition. Now, we're going to do that, and, and the practice, if you haven't done it, is that I will invite you to pray about something, and I'll suggest a topic, and then we will go at that in silence, and at the end we will have a colic that I will, I will pray. Now, I'll tell you in advance, if you haven't done this before, it, you might be uncomfortable about it, and I can tell when people are uncomfortable because when you get a little too much silence, people start shifting around and their feet will shuffle and they wonder, you know, when is something going to happen? So you have to gear into this. You have to try to focus, not on the whole world, but focus on the theme for the prayer. Uh, you have to try to avoid letting your mind wander. That happens regularly when it's quiet. You can start thinking about class or what's for dinner or whether the speaker tonight at ASAC is going to be any good. We have to focus and uh, not be uncomfortable with silence. If we can do that, it's really a marvelous uh, way of prayer. The colic will end with the words, through Christ our Lord, and you may respond with an amen at that point, if you wish. Okay? Here's the first bit. Let us now pray and give thanks for this life and the world, for health, for work to do, places to do it, and for all the good which God in his mercy has given and done to us. Let us pray.
morning and welcome to our chapel service this morning. We're going to have announcements beforehand because we have a little bit of a surprise ending for you today. And uh, you will uh, hopefully kind of enjoy our Mardi Gras chapel today. We welcome Herb Brokering, one of our good friends who pops in occasionally. We call him a poet and peacemaker, also a pastor. So welcome Herb. Also welcome to Stephen Crippen. Stephen, uh, of course, is an organ student for Gabe, under Gabe, and Gabe happens to be at Luther Northwestern Seminary today, and Stephen's filling in, so thanks, Stephen. Uh, we want to bring to your attention a couple of things. This week, of course, is Ash Wednesday. We will have two Ash Wednesday service, services here. The first is in the morning. It will be a, a communion service uh, with several stations, so we can finish that in 20 minutes. But in the evening, we have a little bit more time, and we include the imposition of ashes, so you are invited to both of those. We also want to remind you that Thursday this week, President Anderson will be presenting uh, a have a presentation on the Christian attitudes toward war and peace and historical and theological perspective. And that will be here at 7 p.m. in the evening. We also want to remind you that this weekend is Vocatio Retreat. Kristen, wave your hand. Talk to Kristen there. I think it's pretty full, but we could sneak a couple more people in there if we wanted. So talk to Kristen after chapel today. That's this weekend we leave Friday night and come back Saturday afternoon. And uh, leadership positions, uh, technically we, we close uh, the application deadline Friday, but I think if you're still interested, we, we could put uh, you into consideration still today. Let's begin worship today with prayer. Mighty God, Stay with us always as we worship and as we share the risk and challenge of living our faith. By your powerful spirit, turn our fear to courage and our confusion to confidence. Your glory shines in the face of Christ. Shine in our hearts and lives. May your name be praised, glorious God. Amen. Would you please rise for the gospel? Gospel from the book of Mark, chapter 9. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his garments became glistening, intensely white, as no fuller on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking to Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is well that we are here. Let us make three booths, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were exceedingly afraid. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my son, the beloved one. Listen to him. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the man of heaven should have risen from the dead. Please stay standing. When I saw this cross the other week after Gabe's wonderful evening with his friends and us, uh, I stared at it I studied it, and I wrote what I could see, and I put it into the tune of Earth and All Stars, because although Earth and All Stars was written for St. Olaf, it was born on this campus, which some of you don't know. And so the life of Earth and All Stars goes on, and we'll sing just the first four stanzas, because there are streamers, and there are beads and bottle caps and plastic, but when you look at it more closely, you'll see the wind. Yeah, there's not wind hanging there, but banners like wind. And banners like wind, and wind likes reeds. And reeds are on your campus, you play them. And, and bottles like cider, and cider likes a chalice, and chalice likes a community. 
And so there's always a top line and a bottom line. The top line in every stanza is what I saw there. The bottom line is when you look further. It's kind of a transfigured look. And you can improve this. This is sort of a first draft. We'll sing the first four stanzas and then you may be seated. Several years ago, I saw a man in Texas who was a military hero. I guess you can be a church hero, a student hero, and there are military heroes. And in the kitchen of his house, he told me that he was being taken to a shed, and they were going to interrogate him and punish him, and he couldn't stand it. So he said to God in prayer, show me a bird. And he said, on the way to the shed, I saw a sparrow. The door was shut. He was coward. He said, oh God, I am truly a beggar. Just show me one more bird. And he said, under the door, I saw the shadow of a bird. And he said, I don't think that God especially sent either bird, but he helped me see them. They were there. And this cross is there. I can't, buy, I can't walk by anything so unusual without stopping often and wondering what brokenness has to do with cross and what plastic has to do and with washers and bolts have to do that bolt together machinery and F-16s. I mean, it's all there. So to get ready for today, I looked under cross and I read the Bible and there's so much to read. It took me far too long. Luckily, it wasn't wasted time because I never do that. But I did find that I could talk with you about the cross as a mark, a mark on the sand or on the body 
I once marked it on a woman who was dying, and she was used to sitting so far as you are from the pastor that when I marked it over her whole body, she laughed because it was so close. <laughs> when you're 15 feet away, a mark doesn't look so big, but when the minister lies and leans over you and, and uh, makes the mark from head to foot, it looks big. Even when you're sick, you can laugh. That's called juxtaposition, when things get scary and wonderful because they're so clear. And I found that in the Bible it says that it's a mark of suffering. And if you keep looking, the Bible says that the cross is a mark of love. And if you watch it grow, it's a mark of glory. And finally, it's a mark of victory. So if you see a cross, it's not just one thing. And this isn't either. But then I thought, I don't have time in 20 minutes to do all that, so I'll go to Webster. Because Webster will say something about the cross, so I spent two hours in Webster. I wrote down 15 things that Webster says about the cross. They're wonderful things, like it's a pipe fitting with branches in the form of a cross used as a junction for intersecting pipes. I thought that was a very interesting idea of the cross, and then I wanted to tell you about 1968, when in Detroit, Michigan, we had a large youth gathering, and we uh, connected the altar in the youth gathering with the sewer system of Detroit with pipes. And so the whole water system and the sewage system of Detroit was hooked to the altar. And they're still wondering what that meant. It just means that everything gets connected and the cross is a pipe fitting with branches in the form of a cross used as a junction for intersecting places. And each one of these 15 were so important that I realized I wouldn't have time to talk about them either, and my time is almost away. You know, when you focus on one thing, there is a lot. It's called ubiquity, and if you have a little, you have enough, if you know what to do with a little. So then I focused on a phylactery. A phylactery was a way of getting wrapped up in something if you were Jewish. And you put them around your head and your heart and your hand. And so I thought of the word head, mind, soul, and hand. And I connected it with the sacred head of Christ. Only I used the word head each time because I thought of the one on the cross who had this crown pressed into his head. And now ministers wear it as a clerical collar because that's what the crown became. And everything has an old story and everything is on the move and crosses aren't over and you can fly them today and you can stand underneath them and you can get hit by them because crosses were punishment, crosses were penalty I rode in a cross in 1968, it was called a Lafayette. It was a submarine, a nuclear submarine, and I walked between 16 nuclear missiles. And that was a cross. And I suppose by now, it has fired somewhere. Or it's too old, and it's like a broken piece of glass. So I have in the first two stanzas of O Sacred Head, the head of Christ and his heart, the head of Christ and his hands. We'll sing those, then we'll read the next one, the head of Christ and his mind. What is on the mind of Christ? And then the head of Christ and his soul. And then the last stanza, we'll sing the head of Christ and his roses in the desert where roses always bloom, not only in Isaiah. So we will sing, O Sacred Head.
angels and the bombers. How heavy they now feel, oh sacred hands of Jesus, each sword must turn to come. So Now we read, O sacred head of ages, all eons you have seen. There are no times or places where you have never reigned. O sacred mind of Jesus, high on the greenwood tree, you knew from the beginning all that would ever be. O sacred head of Jesus, what dust blows in your eyes, your tongue and lips are thirsty, your face is full of flies, O oh, sacred soul of Jesus. Our bounty on your head, and all we need you gave us, till grave be just a bed. O oh, sacred head of Jesus, with mercy see your Zanono. And the other day I received a letter from a proud grandfather saying that his 13-year-old child or grandchild had a wonderful word. I had given him a word, the, in the summer. It'll be a nice word for the boy. It's a nice word. It will never embarrass him. He'll spell it right from the beginning. It'll be a friendly word. And now... His family has given him another word, and he likes it. It's yes. That's what the world needs. So I, re I wrote what I would say as a prayer to my very younger new brother, Matthew. And I'll read you some of it. Because I write these letters, and I've written 60 poems and hymns since the war. And I've written many letters, and to little Matthew, I said, yes is a good picture, Matthew. Yes is a big exclamation mark for something very true. And yes can be the colors of a rainbow in any order. And yes looks like a toy that you don't ever want to lose. And yes makes you look inside and like what you see. And yes is a big splash over all of you, and you're safe. And yes, can taste like milk or chocolate or even medicine. And yes, smells like a place you really like, like home. And yes, feels like a quilt or sometimes like nothing at all. And yes, has God all through it and around it at once. And yes, is so holy that it sometimes stays blank. Yes, looks around, between and under and over all at once. And yes is a boy and a girl who look at each other real good. Yes is a piece of bread that's more than what it looks. Yes can have famous relatives and stay normal. Yes is your favorite word for reasons only you know. Yes can be a place that grows and grows on you and you visit it. Yes goes on and on even though it's finished. Yes makes wonderful faces. And yes is another way to spell Jesus. And may the peace of God, which passes all yeses, keep our hearts and minds in faith in Christ Jesus, God's great big yes. And now we're going to take the cross where we have our drink.
and our food and our community. And we're going to sing on the way out following this cross, whatever stanzas you want to, beginning with canisters and spools and miles of sand. But when we're out there, we're all going to sing willows that weep. So if we have some help here for David, we're going to sing and leave. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure.
please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel is recorded in the 15th chapter of St. Mark. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion, who stood facing him, saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was God's Son. The Gospel of the Lord. read Psalm 23 responsively. The women will take the lead. The men will respond to the women. 
the Lord is He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever.
from the letter of Paul to the Colossians. As God's chosen one, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts. Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Thanks to Gabe for a wonderful selection of love songs and scripture. We remind you that tonight our president will speak on the subject listed in the bulletin, Christian Attitudes About War and Peace and Historical and Theological Perspective, a subject which he knows a great deal about. And we remind you that tomorrow Clark Morphew from the St. Paul Dispatch and Pioneer Press will be here as our guest. Receive the benediction. But as for you, child of God, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. Guard what has been entrusted to you. Grace be with you. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks.